All righty. So this is chapter 10. It's all about capillary puncture equipment and procedures. Here are the NACL's competencies. So you can see what we're going to be covering and what the objectives are as well. There's quite a bit in this chapter. So drops of blood can be obtained by making a puncture or an incision into the capillary bed in the dermal layer of the skin. What does all that mean? Basically on the tip of the finger or on the edge of the heel where we use our, where we do these things, we can puncture the skin, we can make it a, a small cut and collect blood in that way. Technically this is called a capillary puncture or a dermal puncture. Uh, you'll also hear it called skin puncture, finger stick, or heel stick. The things that we do, the things that we use, the equipment, we're going to need lancets. Those are the incision devices. They're going to be sterile, disposable, um, and they're going to also have a blade that permanently retracts once it's been used. That's an OSHA requirement. Your book also will talk about something called a laser lancet, and you can read about that or see, you know, look it up on YouTube. I've never used one, so I only know what you know. I've read the book. Uh, one of the other pieces of equipment you need are a micro collection container. That's the little tiny tubes that the blood goes in. We call these microtubes or bullets because of the way that they're shaped. Um, they're basically the exact same thing as the ETS tubes, except they don't have a vacuum, so they're not evacuated tubes. But the color code, the additives, that's all mostly the same. And they're measured in microliters instead of uh, milliliters. Oops, I went one too far. Um, sometimes, and we haven't done syringe draws, but every now and then you have a hard stick, you're drawing blood into a syringe and you don't get a lot. Maybe you're using a butterfly and a baby, and you're going to take that blood that's out of a venous draw and you're going to put it into a tube that can hold that much blood. You might put it into one of these microtubes. You just have to make sure that you label it as venous blood. Otherwise, the techs down in the lab are going to assume that microtubes, these bullets, contain capillary blood, and they're going to use the reference ranges for capillary blood unless you tell them not to. That's one of those just one-offs, just in case you got to remember this little exception to the rule. So here's a picture of all of our equipment. So you're going to see up in the uh, upper left-hand corner, you see some examples of the lancets here. You get the laser lancet is E. Um, we have ones kind of like D and A in class. Uh, then we can move over to the upper right-hand side, sorry. And that's where you see some different variations of the microtubes. And then we have other lancets down here on the bottom. Um, those are usually used for heel sticks, um, but they're, base, it's all, they're all the same thing as the other lancets. So these are called tender heels or something like that, tender foots. They have cute little pediatric sounding names. Um, there's also microhematocrit tubes. These are a little narrow bore plastic or plastic clad glass tubes. They look like little baby straws, kind of. They fill by capillary action. They hold um, about 50 to 70 microliters. They're used for a hematocrit and pack cell volume. You'll see these used, like if you ever go donate blood on the big red bus, and they do the thing where they squeeze a drop of blood into the liquid, but they're not really sure, and they have to test it further, and you'll see them usually collect your blood into one of these little straw-like things, stick it in a machine, and it runs these tests. It's kind of cool. So are the additives that are in them usually. We don't, we're not going to really use them much in class if you work somewhere where you have to do this. They'll, they'll train you on the specific equipment that you'll have in class. So a capillary blood gas, We'll talk more about blood gases when we talk about um, in the arterial chapter. Uh, that's the last week. I think it's like chapter 14 or something like that. Um, it's not as desirable to use capillary blood as it is to use arterial blood for blood gas analysis. And what is blood gas analysis? The gases that are in your blood are the gases that we breathe in the air. So when they want to test and see that a person has enough oxygen in their blood or not too much carbon dioxide in their blood, then they'll do a blood gas and they do a specific type of blood collection of a specific type of analysis that lets them know there's this much oxygen in the blood and there's this much carbon dioxide in the blood and whatever other um, things that they look at. So in general, even though they can do a capillary blood gas, most places are going to use an arterial blood gas instead. Um, capillary blood gases are not usually done in adults, so if they can't do an arterial for some reason, they'll do a capillary and that'll be on like a kid. Most of the time, phlebotomy folks are not collecting blood gases. That's going to be a respiratory therapist's job because that's what they deal with. They, they need to know the patient's levels of oxygen and all that stuff to be able to do their job. Um, or if a respiratory therapist isn't doing it, and especially trained nurses, 
if you work somewhere that would require you to do this, you would be specially trained. However, most of the facilities in this county, none of them that I know of have phlebotomists do this. So therefore, we don't really do it. So we just kind of talk about it and we'll read the procedure. I'm not really any more knowledgeable about blood gases than you will be at the end of this course because I've never done one. I don't have any further training in them. I know what I was told when I had a job uh, as a phlebotomist, which was very, very little, and what I've read about um, in, in the textbooks. So don't stress too, too much about all this, but you can look at the procedures on page 340, 341, and it explains how they're collected and the equipment that you need. Sometimes we have to collect glass slides so that they can do hematology determinations. We will be having a guest speaker come in to do a demonstration and we'll all do some blood smears. And there is a procedure in your book, page 319 to 320. So if you could read over that before we do our demonstration, and I'll have to check the calendar and I'll put it in Canvas so you know, but we do have the lab tech instructor program manager coming in to work with us and she'll tell us a little bit more about why blood smears are done and how to do them and all of that stuff. I'm terrible at making blood slides because where I worked we didn't do them so I've never really had a whole lot of practice. Um, I'll do them with you guys in class and you guys can all see how terrible I really am at this. But if I practice a lot, I'm sure I could get better at that. So there's some tests. The only other time, the only time I remember collecting slides, I didn't collect them again. I just helped collect them was when I had to do an LAP, this leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. And whenever you have to collect slides for um, a test, like this test is ordered LAP. And so when I pulled the patient's orders up, they come up, it says LAP. We used to, where I work, we used to call the lab. They would come over with this, the number of slides that they need, and then we would draw their blood, you know, the rest of their blood via uh, uh, venous draw. And then we would do these, and they had to be fresh. So they, the tech would come right over, we'd collect the slides, and then they take that right over to the, the lab and do their testing right on it. So. Um, we'll, to, we'll do this more in class, the glass slide stuff. Um, as far as capillary blood gases and slides go, we're talking in the order of draw for capillary punctures, which we haven't gotten to yet. Those, that would be the order. You would do capillary blood gases first if you had to. You would do slides next if you had to do them. And then you would collect your tubes and da da da. And there is a slide that talks about that, but I wanted to make sure that that was, uh, I drew attention to that. Some of the other equipment you want to use is a warming device. Um, in class, I told you guys you can fill up a, a glove, make like a water balloon out of a glove. Just use the hot water. You don't want to make it too hot. You can use a towel dampened with warm water. But basically, you always want to warm the site. It's going to increase blood flow up to seven times, and it's just going to make it so much easier to get your job done. The composition of capillary specimens, it's a mix of arterial and venous blood, and that's what makes up capillary blood. Because if you think about it, when you look at, we haven't talked about chapter six, but when you look at the anatomy of the arteries and veins and vessels, it goes, you know, from the heart through an artery down to these slightly smaller arteries called arterioles, down, and those break down into smaller branches called capillaries, which feed into small branches of veins called venules, which then feed into larger veins, which then go back to the heart. So if you imagine that, you've got venous blood that's kind of hanging out there that's the blood that after it's been delivered to the cells it goes into the veins and it's on its way back to the blood arterial blood is going to be a little bit more in the capillaries because it pumps in whereas venous blood just flows out more slowly so there's always going to be a slightly higher mix of arterial blood than venous blood in our capillary blood it's also mixed with the intracellular fluid that's the fluid that hangs out within the cells and the fluid that hangs out um, within the cells and within the spaces between the cells. All that fluid's also mixed in with the blood and that's what we call capillary blood. Um, and that's why the reference values are slightly different for that. So we have arterial blood has, you know, a certain value, say you're testing glucose. So I don't know what the reference ranges are at the moment, but you know, glucose v v normal value for venous blood is going to be one number versus it's going to be a different number for arterial blood versus a different number for capillary blood. Um, there are some examples here on the notes. It says glucose and potassium are normally higher in capillary blood compared to venous blood, whereas total protein, calcium, and sodium are usually lower in capillary blood than they are in venous blood. And if we were more advanced studies here, we could look into the anatomy and physiology of why that is, but we're not going to worry about that at the moment. So when, why do you do, when would you want to do a capillary puncture? 
when we're talking about older children and adults, not, not newborns that we're sticking their heels for, but for, for older kids and older people, we would use, we would do a capillary puncture when the veins are fragile or unavailable or we can't find it or when they've been saved for other procedures like we talked about in class already, like chemotherapy. Um, when you can't get the venipuncture, you just, just keep sticking and missing. Um, and sometimes when you have what's called point of care testing to do, that's what the POCT stands for. So like a glucose meter, there's other tests that can be done besides glucose that come on similar instruments. You can do that right at the bedside. And we have a whole chapter we'll talk about that stuff. That's another reason you might do a capillary puncture. We're doing it for kids, babies and stuff. It's because we want a smaller volume of blood drawn out. Um, and for newborn screenings, which we're going to talk a little bit about too. So there's some tests that cannot be collected by capillary puncture. One of them is an ESR. It's an erythrocyte sedimentation rate. I don't remember the reason for that, but we're not. You just have to remember you don't do ESRs in um, finger sticks. Coagulation studies that require plasma. There's there are some blue finger stick microtubes out there in the in the world, but they're not meant to hold capillary blood, they're actually just like mini venous tubes. Um, it can be confusing. They don't make light blue top bullets. They just don't. When you're doing a coagulation study, that would be like a PT, a PTT. Um, there's a whole number of them on your requisition you can look at. You have to do those via the venous blood in the regular tube, or you have to be using a specialized point of care instrument that's made for collecting one of those tests via a finger stick. And I can show you an example of that in class if you remind me. Um, another test that cannot be collected via capillary puncture is a blood culture. We haven't done those yet, but I've showed you the bottle that they go in. You have to have 8 to 10 milliliters of blood per bottle. So as you can imagine, we're not going to get that kind of blood out of a finger stick. Same thing with any test that requires a large amount of serum or plasma. Now in chapter six, we're gonna talk more about serum and plasma, but basically what serum or plasma is, is it is the liquid portion of blood that isn't red blood cells, white blood cells, and, and platelets. So if you put them in a centrifuge, this, the test tube full of blood, you put it in a centrifuge, it's gonna spin it down, it's gonna force the heavier elements to the bottom, and let the lighter elements go to the top. The heavy elements are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and those platelets. They're gonna get sucked down to the bottom, and then on the top, you're gonna have this like yellowish liquid. It's mostly water, but it's also made up of depending on if it's plasma, it'll have clotting factors. If it's serum, it won't have clotting factors, but they'll both have proteins and hormones and all this other stuff. And that's what we most of the time are testing in the lab. When you take a test tube of blood and you put it in, you know, you draw it, you say you get four cc's of blood, four milliliters of blood. When you spin it down, you're going to have about half of that testable liquid, that serum or plasma. You're only going to get about two cc's of blood. So if you have a test that requires two milliliters of serum, that means you need four milliliters of blood, which means you cannot collect that via a capillary puncture. You'll just never get that much blood considering that the capillary tubes hold, you know, they're measured in microliters, not milliliters. So anything that requires a whole bunch of blood is not going to be able to be done via capillary puncture. So the order of draw for capillary collections is not the same as venipuncture collections. The reason for that is because when we puncture the skin, it releases this stuff called tissue thromboplastin. It's basically a chemical that starts the coagulation process. And remember, the coagulation process is the process by which our body forms a clot and, prevent, and, and stops the, the process of bleeding. So we have to collect our specimens quickly so that we can reduce the effects of that platelet clumping and microclot formation that's occurring because of this coagulation process that's naturally occurring. We can't stop our body from doing that. So we collect our hematology specimens first. That's our purple top tubes. Remember, this is after capillary blood gases and slides if we had those ordered. But most of the time you don't. So we're going to start with our purple tops, our lavender tops. Hematology test, okay? They cannot have any microclots or platelet clumping in them. Any of the clotting process things that occur, they will affect our hematology specimens, and those tests can't be collected, can't be run when those specimens have clots in them. After that, we can collect our serum specimens last because they are supposed to clot. And serum specimens, serum comes from blood that has been allowed to clot. So our red tops, our gold tops, those amber colored tubes, those would be our last, the ones we would collect last because it's okay if they clot. So in between hematology specimens and the serum specimens would be your other additives like green tops, your heparin, or gray tops, your oxalates. So if you're looking at the actual order of draw, if I ask you to tell it to me, what I want to see is the first thing is these blood gas specimens, then slides, 
than EDTA specimens, then our other specimens, other additive specimens, such as green and gray, or heparin and oxalate, and then our serum specimens, which are clot activator, right? In your book, in one place, it lists slides, then EDTA, then other specimens, and serum specimens. In another place in your book, it lists the blood gases, then EDTA, and da 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 da. It doesn't list blood gases and slides together in the same list, so I've listed them here in the notes for you. And hopefully, I remember to tell everybody that, so that way it's uh, oh, apparent to everyone. If you're doing the new newborn screening tests, which are the PKUs, I think I already said this in class, they generally like these to be collected um, separately from a separate draw. So the capillary puncture steps, we've already done this in lab, but just in case you're viewing this early, um, steps one through four are going to be the exact same. You're going to put on gloves, you're going to identify your patient. If your patient is an infant, then you need to identify either with the nurse or have mom or somebody verbally identify the patient. Obviously, a kid can't. And when they're, un when they're minors, you have to get parental permission, okay? You want to get the patient in position, and for a newborn baby, that's going to be, you know, a little different because you got they're usually in a little bassinet. You got to wrap them up, learning how to swaddle, which I'll show you guys how to swaddle. I'll have to remember to bring in a blanket uh, to lab, but we'll do that, and that way you guys can see how you would want to wrap up a baby. So anyway, you're going to picture pick your site um, for be, uh, adults and older children. You can use the middle or ring finger, um, centrally. The kind of the middle fleshy portent but slightly off center and perpendicular to any of the grooves of the fingerprint and on the babies you're going to use their heel and it's on the medial lateral plantar surface so i showed you what that was in the class it's the sides of the bottom of the heel so anywhere that's swollen or bluish in color or previously punctured we want to avoid and here's a slide that shows you the, the medial is on the side of the big toe, because that's towards the middle of the body. The lateral side is near the side of the baby toe, towards, um, I'm sorry, the medial is towards the center of the body, the lateral is towards the sides of the body, and the plantar surface means foot. And then you see the pictures of the fingertips, and then you see how deep we're cutting into the capillary bed there. So if you, once you've selected your site, you know where you're going to go, apply heat, all right, that's going to make it flow better. Remember, let that heat sit there for a little bit. Once it's done getting warmed up, then you're going to clean the site with your alcohol. So we don't want to use iodine on any these four tests, but in general, if you can avoid using iodine, you would want to. Um, we want to use alcohol, but we want to make sure we let it dry all the way so that way it doesn't interfere with our testing or cause a stinging sensation. We're going to prepare, get all of our stuff ready, our gauze. We're going to have our Band-Aid nearby, our tubes, everything ready. And then we're going to get that finger or heel in our hand. And we're going to hold the lancet with our dominant hand. And then we're going to position that in place, puncture the site, and then immediately throw the lancet away. Everyone in class gets in the habit of setting these down. If you set them down, then you're likely to forget them or lose them in a patient's bed or in the, in the bassinet. So you want to get in the habit of as soon as you press that button, you toss it in the sharp. So make sure you can reach your sharps box from wherever it is that you're puncturing at. Make sure you actually keep the lancet against the skin when you go to activate it. Make sure you give a warning. Then you're going to lower the finger or heel. Remember, gravity helps us, and we're going to apply gentle pressure. Talking about using the fingers, you're going to use the, the meaty portion of the bottom of your, pan, your palm of your hand, and you're going to use your fingers. You're going to press your palm against your fingers rather than trying to squeeze up by your knuckles. We don't ever really – it says don't squeeze – it depends on what your definition of squeezing is or milking is. So the way that I'll show you in lab is the way that you need to do it. That's really all you need to know. Um, we're not ever going to double stick, so it doesn't flow. You don't stick them again. So once you've stuck, you get you squeeze the finger or the heel, get that first blood, blood of dro mm, drop of blood, and then you're going to wipe it away. This first drop is usually contaminated with excess tissue fluid, and that's the main reason we wipe it away, but it could contain alcohol residue, so that's a secondary reason that we wipe it away. If I ask the question on a test, I want to know the first main reason, which is contamination with excess tissue fluid. If you forget the alcohol residue part, that's fine, but if you only give me alcohol residue, that's not the correct answer. There are some point of care instruments that require the use of the first drop where you wouldn't wipe it away, which is so confusing that they would, why would they do that? But uh, make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions when you're using um, point of care instruments like glucose meters and whatnot. So this is showing a picture of that, squeezing the drop, wiping it off. When you wipe off the drop, you have that piece of gauze, do not 
throw it away. You're going to need it again. Supplies are not infinite. They don't come from a magical supply fairy. Somebody pays for these things. So please stop wasting my supplies. Your employers in the future will appreciate it as well. So when you wipe off that first drop, just hold on to that gauze in your pinky or set it down on the table and, and use it again when it's time later on. So we'll continue to, to milk the finger and, or the heel and we'll fill up our tubes. You want to gently tap your microtubes during collection to get the blood to settle and to potentially mix with any of the additives. Uh, you fill them up to the levels that are marked on the tubes. Once they're done, you're going to place gauze on the spite, elevate it and apply pressure. While pressure is being applied, you're going to label your specimen if it has any special handling like protect from light, add to ice, put it on heat, you do that now. Then you'll check the site and make sure it's not bleeding and apply a bandage. Now, if the kid is under two years old, a bandage would be a choking hazard. So you don't actually give them a bandage. You would just continue to hold pressure a little bit longer. So I would say if I held pressure for 30 seconds and then when I lifted it, I didn't see any bleeding, I'd hold pressure for another 30 seconds just to double check. And then I'll peek at it again and make sure that it's actually not bleeding. And then I would let it go. And the same rule applies if the bleeding continues for more than five minutes, you need to contact the doctor. If it is uh, a kid over the age of two, you would leave, tell them to leave their bandage on for 15 minutes. And then you throw away your stuff, thank your patient, remove gloves, sanitize hands, you guys get all that. So there's some um, procedure videos or procedures in your book, and then there's some procedure videos from your book's website you can go check out. So some special capillary procedures include the neonatal bilirubin collection. So neonate is a newborn. It's just another word for a newborn. It's a more technical word. It's commonly used to detect and or monitor increased bilirubin levels. So increased bilirubin, <clears throat> excuse me, can come from a number of reasons. Uh, you can read more about them in your book. If you have high levels of bilirubin, it, then you have a condition called jaundice. It's normally collected via, via, via heel stick in babies. The babies are often placed under a special UV light to help them break down bilirubin. So bilirubin is broken down by light, so that means we have to protect the specimen from light. Hence the reason for these amber color tubes as you see up in the upper right hand corner. If you wanted to collect blood in a non-amber color tube, you could, it's just you would have to then protect it from light. So if we're collecting a specimen from a baby that's under these special UV lights, we need to make sure that we turn off those UV lights before we collect the specimen, okay? We want to try to avoid hemolysis, which can, or I'm sorry, sorry, falsely decrease the bilirubin levels and the results. And we'll talk more about ways that you can avoid hemolysis. For the newborn screening, the NBS, that's what you'll hear people call PKUs, this is state-mandated testing of newborns for a certain genetic, metabolic, hormonal and functional disorders. Uh, we talked a little bit about PKU already in class. Um, we'll talk about it here too. These disorders can cause major uh, issues for these children, but if they're detected early, they can be treated early and the health outcomes will be better as a result. So every test or every state tests for at least 26 of these um, 26 different disorders, 42 states screen for 29 disorders, and there's a couple of states that even screen for up to 50 disorders. You can look up, uh, there's a website, I think I have it linked in here, what Florida tests for. Um, PKU is just one test in all of the screening, the phenylketonuria. Um, other tests would be galactosemia, hyperthyroidism. Those three are required by all 50 states. Um, and now cystic fibrosis is also mandatory in all, all states as well. So PKU is a defect in the e enzyme that actually breaks down phenylalanine. I should know how to say these better, which is in all food. Um, and the enzyme converts it into tyrosine. But if you don't have this enzyme or it doesn't work right, you can't break it down and it'll accumulate in your blood. Once, if it keeps accumulating in your blood, then it can raise toxic levels and can lead to brain damage and mental retardation. One in 10,000 to 25,000 births, this, is, this occurs in. So if we catch it early, we can change the baby's diet ahead of time and the baby won't ever have a problem. Whereas if we wait, if we don't know that this, if we don't do this test, if the patient's parents don't find out, then they'll feed them food, you know, all food, won't treat it, and then by the time they recognize that there's something wrong with their kid, it's too late. So it's really, really important that we do these things on time. Hyperthyroidism can hinder growth and brain development. That's more common, one in 4,000. Um, galactosemia, 
is an inherited disorder and that means that this enzyme needed to convert milk sugar galactose into glucose isn't there so then they could have failure to thrive within a week so that's a serious one too it's not as common cystic fibrosis is a mutation in a gene that is re responsible for regulating the transport of chloride across cell membranes we're getting kind of into the nitty-gritty of cellular biology here but it basically it'll affect a lot of organs but primarily you're gonna see it affect the lungs and the pancreas I spelled pancreas wrong sir um, if they start interventions and treatments early they can extend the life expectancy and also reduce the distress and malnutrition that is a result of cystic fibrosis so how do we do this? So the blood spot collection is usually collected when the infant is between 24 to 72 hours old, although newer state rules allow testing as early as 12 hours old as long as the baby's had a full meal. It's collected on special filter paper. Um, I do have some samples of this, I believe, in the lab, so remind me and I will show you these. There's little circles on them and you have to feel it, fill the circle from the heel puncture. The heel can't touch the paper. Only one drop is allowed inside of each circle and it can't overlap with anything else and the circle must be completely filled. They have to air dry horizontally. They have these little like drying racks. They look like CD racks laid on their side and you like set the paper in there to, to dry it. There is a procedure on page 317 you can look at. And here's a picture of the card and all that information would be filled out, the baby's name, date of birth, submitter name, all that stuff would be on there. And then we drop the blood into those circles on the side there. So there's some case study, we can talk about that and the questions and the answers. And that is it for chapter 10.